On today's episode of The Intellectual Podcast, we'll be covering the massive box office numbers for Avengers Endgame, the sad loss of our Chewbacca, Peter Mayhew, and Game of Thrones' big battle has arrived. What were our thoughts? You'll find out more on this episode of The Intellectual Podcast. I'm Willie D. Nelson from All Things Good and Nerdy, a pop culture podcast, part of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other tantalizingly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The intellectual podcast starts now. That's right. The intellectual podcast starts now. I'm your host, David S. Dawson, and joining me remotely is... Whitney Wegman. Whitney, hey, Whitney Wigman Wood. <laughs> Whitney Wigman Wood. Is that I've the official that the official moniker for you now, right? That that is official, yes. I've changed okay. all of my media over to Whitney Wigman Wood, the three W's. So that's the three official. W's. <laughs> it's it's kind of fun. It's fun having that many names. So can I call you Trip Dubs now? <laughs> yeah. What's funny is in uh in undergrad, my nickname was Double Dubs. So yeah, now I'm Trip Dubs. There you go. I like <laughs> you, it. You are the walking internet. <laughs> ah, it's been a while, Wit. How, how, how have things been? Busy, really busy, like all the time. I feel like I'm driving back and forth to LA at least once a week. Uh, yeah. Well, why don't we start the episode off just real quick with a uh, with an actor's update? Because uh, you're on the journey of full time acting now. How how is yeah. that going? Um, it's going well. So it's it's interesting because a lot of it is you know working at home. Um, which I'm trying really hard to keep myself regimented to like having a normal work schedule, uh, which is hard. I, I, you work at home. Like, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you're like in the middle of working and you look over and you're like, oh my God, there's tons of dishes to do. Let me go get distracted with doing dishes. Uh, I'm really bad about, uh, procrastinating and like getting distracted by things. So, uh, yeah, a lot of times I have to take myself out of my home for work time. Like I'll go to a cafe down the street and sit and have coffee and work. Well, I think that's um, a big thing that's led to the uh, explosion of Starbucks around the world is everybody who works at home uh, uses them as their as their as their quote unquote office uh, yeah. because, because there are too many distractions at home. There really are. And so I've actually been using um, Butler's uh, shout out to Butler's. They're a uh, beautiful. It's a. Um, I think they're a chain, but it's like a local chain because I think there's only three of them around San Diego. Uh, I really like their, well, I like their ambiance. I like that you can sit there and like literally sip on one drink and they don't complain at all. <laughs> um, and they have a Harry Potter, uh, a butterbeer coffee drink. Uh, that's amazing. Like I'm not even that big of a Harry Potter fan, but this thing's awesome. <laughs> well, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, uh, typical day with, with doing like the at-home actor stuff is uh, I'll, su- I'll do submission boards in the morning. So that's like Actors Access, Backstage, uh, Frontier Casting, LA Casting. I think I've hit all of them. I, and I have subscriptions to all of them. And that takes anywhere, like each one, it takes between an hour to two hours to do all the submissions. Wow. And then, yeah. Yeah, so that's like right there between four and six hours. So I'm almost hitting that eight hour mark already. Uh, but then if I get any hits back, you know, usually they're asking to film sides and stuff like that. So if it's something that I can film myself, I do it myself because I have a great little setup. Uh, and a lot of it can be done on computer, which is awesome. And then I uh, will edit it on um, Creative Cloud, which is great. So I can get a nice quality edit to send back. And if I have to have a reader, I, I usually wait for John or, you know, hit up somebody in town and be like, hey, you want to come and hang out? I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so that. And then uh, once in a while, I'll have to drive up to L.A. for like, you know, auditions and stuff. Uh, last week, I went up to L.A. to get new headshots done. Um, Peggy Warney did my headshots. So that's Headshots by cool. Peggy? Yeah, headshots by Peggy. Um, we've had a couple ads for her headshots on our podcast. So we have indeed. She's Peggy. a 
She's a big supporter of this podcast and she's got her own uh, web series of interviews that she does as well, which is, which are, I've been a guest on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. She's great. We love. Peggy. So I'll tell you, I, I, uh, I told her this, like the last few rounds of headshots I've done, I've looked at them and I've just gone, have I just grown out of being photogenic? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I just did not like them at all. But this time, and we really took our time, like in between, we'd like have some coffee and, you know, shoot the shit. And uh, we definitely hit a point where I feel like, okay, I, I relaxed into it because we got some headshots that, um, so my, my agent has been telling me for a while, he's like, I need a picture that explains exactly who you are in one picture. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's like an easy order there. Like, explain everything about yourself in one picture. Like I get it. Pictures worth a thousand words, but, um, I think we got a few that are in there that I'm like, yep, that is a, yep. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. There, I, I have, well, my grandmother, the, the pictures that I feel like look the most like me are kind of, um, my grandma would be like, wow, that's a little Fred look. Cause I, me and my dad have these similar facial expressions Usually when somebody's saying something really dumb and we look at them like they're really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got that look. It's it's called my face. <laughs> Resting smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest it's ever been described, but sure, we'll go with that. Um <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I did that. Um I am getting ready to gear up to do a feature here at the end of May. We have a, a table read and we're going to start doing rehearsals and that's with, um, chaotic clone productions. Um, and then I, I'm in the running for uh, a supporting role and a feature that's shooting down in Atlanta. So we'll see how that pans out. Um, I got a really nice note back from the director, which I wasn't expecting because it was all, you know, online video submissions and, uh, he was very complimentary with uh, my video and how professional it looked and how well edited it was. I was like, yeah, I did that editing, man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so just hustling last Sunday. <laughs> Poor John. I have to, I make him do so much. He's such, a, he is such a good husband for an actress. We shot like six different uh, audition videos last Sunday, just one after another, like we'd take a little break. I'd change my makeup, change my hair, set up for the next shot. And he just rolled with it. He was great. <laughs> He's a good reader. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It's good to have a uh, good support at home. Yeah, so. it really is. He actually, he gets into it. Like he does little voices if he has to read for two different characters and stuff. <laughs> he's a little theatrical himself it's nice <laughs> well i think he'd have to be to be married to you um <laughs> so let's uh let's move into the topics of discussion for this episode um since this isn't an interview episode uh, or a discussion yeah. episode if you will it's a just discussion between you and i i thought we could talk a little bit about movies um well, why don't we start with the with the sad news first um uh, the news just rolled out right before we started podcasting that uh, uh, my Chewbacca, the one that I grew up with, um, Peter Mayhew, uh, died on April 30th at the age of 74. Um, I don't know about you, but that really, really bums me out. I mean, yeah, it's it's sad, especially when you think about how many of those original Star Wars performers have have passed in the last couple of years. And well, and obviously, like, their characters are no longer part of the franchise either. So, um, yeah, yeah it's like imagine it. the saga is coming to an end and, you know, one by one, I, I can feel it one by one. We're going to be losing all these people that I grew up with on the screen. You know, it's like it's sad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, because it's a. Uh, it's interesting, right? The connections that we have to celebrities and performers because they so shaped our, our young lives that we feel deeply connected to them, even if we don't know them personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Star Wars shaped so much of my childhood and it's actually shaped a lot of my adult life as well in that the inspiration to become a storyteller, to become a filmmaker 
a lot of that stemmed from those youthful experiences of Star Wars and and specifically watching behind the scenes documentaries about Star Wars. There was so much behind the scenes stuff about Star Wars that that my generation, especially, I think we, we grew to love the actors as much as these characters. I mean, you don't see Peter Mayhew on screen. He's covered in fur, right? But the man is known to certainly my generation of people, Gen Xers and, and, and older, because we, we watched him in all these behind the scenes documentaries over and over and over again. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, it touches my heart and, um, you know, Steve, Steve Schwartz is the one who let me know that he passed away today. And he, he posted a photo of him with uh, Peter Mayhew at comic con for me a few years back. And, uh, you know, I'm envious. He got to meet Chewbacca. I didn't, I never got that chance myself. So. Yeah. I, um, I mean, so I, I, uh, didn't really watch a whole lot of documentaries. So to be honest, whenever you told me that, like, I, I wasn't really sure who you were referring to. So, I think you're right. Like experientially, uh, Gen Xers probably have a very different experience than people just slightly younger. Yep. Um, yeah. Because uh, you guys were more familiar with that person as a performer, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So anyway, another Star Wars icon has moved on and uh, become one with the force, I hope. Um. But yeah, it's just before uh, May the 4th as well. So yeah. I, know, I know there will be a lot of people uh, memorializing Chewbacca and Peter Mayhew uh, this Saturday. So My cousin probably will be because she specifically had her wedding on May 4th because her husband was like, yes, May the 4th be with you. Yes, let's do our wedding on that day. Her well, new tr- husband's going to be a big nerd. <laughs> he is tr- a big nerd. Ter- Teresa's up in Utah attending the wedding of uh, another friend of ours who's getting married on May the 4th. So, And uh, our former co-hosts of the uh, Sci-Fi Sunday podcast, uh, Jessica and William, they both got married on May the 4th as well. So Aww. it's a thing with nerds. It is. It is. <laughs> and and uh, earlier today, uh, apparently California actually voted in May the 4th is officially Star Wars Day in California. Oh, so. well, that's that's great. Was that <laughs> as a memorialization to? Uh, no, this is before the Chewbacca news came out. Oh, OK. So, anyway, uh, big, big Star Wars news. Um, so have you seen Endgame yet? I have. I saw uh, it um, Friday night. Uh, like you know, so they opened it on Thursday, and we saw it Friday. I saw it before you. You did. You definitely <laughs> did. You saw it like the night of. I saw it Thursday night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At like a seven forty showing or something. Oh wow! Uh, how'd you like it? I have opinions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought it, it was okay. It was okay. It was. Uh, Ouch. That's, that's ouch. Yeah. I, I preferred, um, infinity war. Yeah. I preferred infinity war. Well, I think in a lot of ways, infinity war was the easier story to tell. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Like John and I got out of theater and of course we didn't talk about it the whole way until we got to the car. Cause you just, you know, just in case there are other people with an earshot. Um, yeah, the whole, well, how did you like it, David? How did you like it? Let's start with the positive, shall we? <laughs> well, there's a whole Sci-Fi Sunday podcast, in my opinions. But in in a nutshell, this is me in a nutshell. How did a nut ever get this big? Um, I uh, I loved it. Um, I think uh, for what it needed to be, which was the bookend of a 22 film saga, I, I thought it it. It uh, it hit all the things it needed to hit, and it uh, paid tribute to a lot of things and, and tied back to a lot of stuff that I found surprising that even the writers of these films remembered to tie back to. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's very much the more you remember the other films in the franchise, the better your experience of it is. Um, 
but no, I thought it, I thought it was a very difficult task to uh, craft this film to begin with, and I thought they did a commendable job uh, all the way around. And uh, I'm looking forward to watch it again just to see things that I may have missed because it's it's jam packed with crap. Yeah, I was curious if you were going to go see it again because that was one of the things. I mean, I know that they have already like beat all over uh, all other box office office records, and uh, a lot of the. Infinity War, I think, was because, you know, people went back and saw it three or four times, you know, and uh, to increase those revenues. And I just wonder how many people are going to see this multiple times if there's going to be the same amount. I was actually reading something from uh, uh, I think it was Variety earlier today, and they were citing um, one of the tracking companies, and they said that... uh, the repeat business on Endgame is like double or triple what um, Infinity Wars was at the same time. Oh, wow. Which makes sense because the numbers for the film are like double uh, mm-hmm. at this at this point. Um, so so I'm looking at a at a at gosh, what website? Oh, I'm on the Hollywood Reporter right now. And um Avengers Endgame after eight days sits as the sixth highest grossing movie of all time with 1.6 billion in the global box office. It's now past Star Wars The Force Awakens overseas to become the fourth fourth highest grossing international movie of all time, uh, sitting at 1.21 billion in overseas sales. Now, this isn't a week and a day. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's kind of uh, unbelievable how fast this movie's racking up money. Um, well, it's and, been anticipated for quite some time, you know? Yeah. Well, and Endgame's now the top grossing territory so far are China at 459.4 million, 68.2 million in the UK, 60.3 million in Korea, 48.6 million in Mexico, and 40.9 million in Indi- India. And uh, is sitting at, uh, gosh, uh, where's it at? It's almost, I want to say it's almost 450 million, 500 million here in the States. So uh, the numbers are just incredible. Um, but yeah, is it because it's a good movie? Is it because it's uh, the culmination of 22 films that people love? Um, I don't know. I know a lot of people who've gone back to see it more than once who haven't seen all 22 films in the Marvel cinematic universe. Hmm. So um, I also know a lot of people who haven't seen it yet because they're trying to finish binging the series before we'll heading watch in. all of it. Yeah. So I, I think there's going to be a flurry of extra people going this weekend for the first time, you know, uh, because they've been trying to finish up. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's completely necessary that you've seen all the films, but I mean, there are a lot of, uh, Easter eggs and stuff references to the other films, obviously yeah. tie backs is what I, there's a lot of tie backs to things from the earlier films and, and obs- kind of obscure stuff like Thor, the dark world is suddenly a very important movie to watch. Um, and that's <laughs> right. been the one that everybody's kind of, we're like, eh, you can skip Thor, the dark world. <laughs> <You know>? mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's just very clever on Marvel's part to like make people go back and watch movies that, uh, they had kind of dismissed before or what, but um, no, I just think it, it, it pays off to be a big fan. They, they, it's, this is the most amazing fan service movie I've ever seen. All right. So should we make a spoiler announcement so then we can talk about this in uh, more minutia? Sure. Yeah. If you uh, don't want to be spoiled, uh, tune out now and come back and join our show after you've watched uh, Avengers Endgame. So go ahead. All right. Spoiler, spoiler, spoilers. Spoiler, spoiler, um, spoiler. Uh, okay, so like I said, I I had there were parts that I really liked, okay? So I thought Tony's death sequence was really beautiful. Like I expected him to be the one to go anyway. And uh experientially, because we were sitting in a packed theater. There were people openly weeping. Like, oh yeah, hard, the gr- I thought the girl crying. next to me was going to need medical attention. <laughs> she was crying so hard. <coughs> Pardon me. Um. So, like, I knew they had to get to that point. <clears throat> Sorry, I need a little bit of water. 
getting reclimped. Um, <laughs> the thing that the things the things that I didn't like. Um, they spent so much time setting up and discussing that they couldn't make these branch universes via the time travel. <clears throat> that would be bad. And then they totally did because the fact that Thanos came back from or came from 2014 to 2019 and then at the end there was nothing that indicated that he got sent back to his original timeline well of course he didn't he got he got dusted (laughs) he got dusted so there is another branch uh parallel dimension that now exists where thanos does not exist in 2014 and so the world goes on without thanos uh it just it that the, that aspect annoyed me because they spent so much time discussing how they can't make branches, and then they totally did a real big one. Um, and I'd be curious one to I mean they didn't address it at all, so I'm wondering are they going to use that in future films? Like the fact that there is a parallel dimension where Tony Stark is still alive and well, you know, there's who knows. <laughs> Well, first of all, I don't think that they talked about not making branches. I think what they talked about was the very fact that they'd be going back does create branches. So you can't go back and change what's already happened was one of the things they said. It's not like back to the future. You're not going to go back and destroy yourself. Um, That said, um, the second they arrived in the past, they created multiple branch futures from every spot they landed in, um, which doesn't touch the future. And Tony's GPS time GPS thing keeps them anchored to their timeline. When they return back, they were very specific in explaining a lot of that stuff, but I think there's so much going on in this movie. It's easy to get it kind of all wrapped around. Um, so I think they did a good job explaining it, but I think it's also easy to get lost in the explanations because because it comes from like two or three people. <clears throat> I um, mean, still, based on that <laughs> very idea, and then at the end when Cap goes back and he lives his life um, with Peggy, shouldn't he be existing in a branch dimension at that point? How did he get back to their current dimension? Well, and that's where I think they made the mistake is they went for the dramatic image of him sitting on the bench. <clears throat> As mm-hmm. opposed to just reappearing on the platform as an old man. Yeah. Um, so they leave it to this weird interpretation of like, uh, how did old man Cap arrive in this dimension, essentially? Because um, it feels With like the he shield too. feels like he's just kind of waiting for them, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think they took artistic liberty at that point. I think the intention was that he comes back via the thing because before he left, one of the things they meant that like they took the time to talk about, well, he's going to be gone for five seconds. How's he going to get it all done in that time? Well, it's five seconds to us. It's however long he feels he needs to take. Like they specifically said that before he left. So I think the reality is, is he used the GPS to come back. Um, but maybe because it was so long or whatever, he he zapped not onto the platform, but nearby. I don't know. That's me filling in gaps that I think were taken to create this dramatic entrance for a mm-hmm. cap at the end there. Um, but they did take the time to talk about the fact that like he could take he could take as long as he needs. It'll feel like five seconds to us. But when we bring him back, you know, he'll he'll be back, you know, Um so that said, uh, the taking that creative license does kind of muddy the waters because it's unclear how Cap got back. Um, but I think it was I think it was strictly about taking creative license to give Cap this like dramatic kind of quiet reentrance. Um, so mm-hmm. so I get I get the complaints on the Cap entrance there because it does muddy the waters a little bit. Uh, on the time travel discussion because he doesn't appear 20 feet away where the platform was. He appears 20 feet away where the bench is. Mm-hmm. And so that leaves it up to interpretation how he got there. Yep. 
But it doesn't so, unravel the whole movie for me because I can I can kind of just fill in the gaps and be like, well, he was so time displaced at that point, you know, <clears throat> he may not have just reappeared on the platform. So okay, all right. So okay, justification. Um. Okay. So additionally, now that said, probably, that said, hold on it. before we go on. Uh, <laughs> okay, one of on. one of the one of the things that Marvel's working on is a series of animated. Uh, uh, I don't know if they're shorts or if it's a series, uh, but it'll be on Disney Plus called What Ifs. And in the Marvel Comics universe, the What Ifs lines are what if this happened? What? How would things change? And it's an exploration of, you know, like what would happen if Cap died in World War II? What would have happened if Iron Man had died, you know, in the cave? Um so they've got a whole series of comics where they do that. And they're going to be doing an animated series called what ifs, uh, as part of the MCU on Disney plus. So Let's I think play with this idea of, of multiverses and yeah. So I, I think a lot of news articles have been talking about how Endgame doesn't really set up anything for phase four, but I think they're missing the point. The time travel itself is going to be the big setup for phase four. Yeah. Cause now they have a time machine. <laughs> They have a time machine. They have multiple timelines that are that are broken out. You know, I don't think mm-hmm. it's a coincidence that Loki got the Tesseract and disappeared uh, into a portal in uh, in the one branch timeline. They've got oh, yeah, a whole series. Disney has a they got a whole series out, yeah. based on Loki coming up. So that that uh, my assumption is it's going to be alternate timeline Loki. Yeah, which is Probably. kind of exciting because it means any of these characters can <clears throat> reappear in his storyline on Disney Plus. That's true. Playing playing the older versions of themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. that is true. Um, I did really enjoy uh, Fat Thor. <laughs> to be totally honest. Like, uh, there was what... When he comes out in his sweater and stuff, I leaned over to John. I'm like, he looks like the big Lebowski. And literally <laughs> two seconds later, Tony Stark called him Lebowski. I lost it. I was laughing Get so Get aside, hard. Lebowski. <laughs> I mean, which tells you like their costuming was on point. Oh yeah, because uh, that's immediately what what popped in my head. Um, but okay, okay. So other other issues that I had with this film: uh, Infinity War. The entire time, like just uh, reactionary for me personally as a viewer. I was on the edge of my seat. I was very tense. Like you know, sort of had the heart racing. I did not have that experience with this film. Um, and I guess, you know, part of it was like, you know, the, the, the time that when a five year difference, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's, it just didn't feel the immediacy was not as, as there as in, uh, infinity war. And I feel like the stakes weren't as high to be totally honest. Well, they weren't. I mean, what are the stakes? The stakes are, can we bring them back? Whereas yeah. the stakes before were, can we prevent it from happening? Right. So I, I don't think the stakes could ever be the same. Um, just, just kind of the way it is. Um, you need to have a conversation with John Wood. He came up with a great way that you can make the stakes really high. So your husband's got this like crazy way to make it dramatic and raise the stakes, but yeah, well, yeah. Cause you know, a physicist and thinking on the lines of like multiverses and stuff. So and his also thought, very easy to side seat drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so his thought was just eliminate the whole, like, let's lay down these rules of time travel, blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, it, and you could still do that. You could still do the total time heist thing. Like that's fine. Um, but when it came down to it, like that they kept on going back and screwing things up major and causing like just a ton of branch multiverses to happen, like more than even what we got to see. Um, and so, but the, his idea was in the end, uh, the inevitability was that all these multiverses, no matter what happened, they all ended up at the same place with the battle at the end. Like that was just, no matter what they did, they would always end up at that same battle. And in, in same idea with that last battle sequence, the scene where, you know, they're coming through the portals because that was an awesome visual. But mm-hmm. he's like, instead of it just being all the heroes, it's like every variation of them in the multiverses coming through there. So you have like 
10 Tony Starks, you have 10 Captain America, like all of them fighting, you know, equal numbers of the bad guys on the other side. And you could even get it to the point where like, okay, so Tony Stark has to do the snap. So he has this beautiful death scene, but they're basically fighting for the existence of the entire multiverse. And when he does the snap, it dissolves everything down to a singularity to where all the multiverses collapse back down into one event. Well, I think your husband uh, is on the right track for where I think phase four will go. Oh, yeah? Um, Because there are beings who travel the multiverse like that um, and battle the Avengers in many different forms. And uh, occasionally they all come together because of these battles against like, I think his name's Krang. Okay. Um, He's kind of like the Thanos of the multiverse, um, if you will. Um, He's a fantastic four villain who became an Avengers villain. Um, And I think the, I think the multi timeline, the multi-dimensional multi-universe aspect of things. I think that's also how they're going to bring the X-Men and, and fantastic four um, into the fold going forward. So, um, I think there's a lot of groundwork that was laid here for what they're doing in the next run. Um, and you may not see it in the very first phase necessarily. Um, but you know, the, the difficulty of introducing the mutants in a universe that hasn't seen any mutants yet. Um, and the mutants have a pretty decent history of their own, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, I mean, there are characters that already exist in the X-Men universe, like, uh, um, Quicksilver, like he's alive and well in X-Men and has a different origin story than the Quicksilver, obviously in Avengers. Yeah. Well, same, same could be said with Scarlet Witch because they're still yeah. brother and sister in those universes, yeah. but, uh, the existing X-Men franchise is going to finish and then they're going to start something new for the MCU. Um, but, I, but I think this is how they're going to do it. Hmm. I think it's the way that makes the most sense. Um, cause I think they could do it in similar fashion to the way that they've done, uh, you know, like the introductions of black Panther and the introduction of Spider-Man. Um, and even to some degree, the introduction of Captain Marvel, like you don't have to know the full history of those characters. They just come in and, and you can kind of discover their histories through their own films later. Yeah. Um, and I think I think they'll be able to kind of introduce the X Men universe, if you will, in its own new form for the MCU without having to do a full on origin story film. Yeah, I can see um, that. So you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how they use because this is essentially a new storytelling tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see how they use it. And and I got to figure that's going to play in a little bit on the Wakanda vision not the Wakanda, the, 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 um, Wanda vision. Is that what they're calling it? Yeah. Wanda vision, uh, the Scarlet witch and vision show that, that, uh, they're having on Disney oh. plus as well. Wow. Um, they're just making all sorts of stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a Hawkeye show. Yeah. Um, that's going to be uh Hawkeye's daughter though. Yeah. It's Hawkeye training his successor, which may be his daughter. They kind of set that up a little bit in the movie. Yeah. Um, he did call her Hawkeye. Yep. Um, but yeah. So, you know, <laughs> they, they've they got a game plan in place. Um, and I'm fairly certain that the multi-universe thing is going to come into play for a lot of it. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. But yeah. I, I just find it all enjoyable. So, <laughs> Look and at like. That. Like any time travel movie, you can't pick the time travel too much apart. Yeah. Or the, everything um, falls apart. Or everything falls apart. And, th- and that can be said for Back to the Future and its sequels as well. If you think yeah. about oh, it yeah. too hard, it doesn't make any damn sense at all. So. <laughs> Causality. Causality is an issue in most time travel movies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I Like I said, I, I the lack of stakes and, and Thanos kind of like wasn't wasn't that much of a big bad anymore you know 
Mm, was he? He basically took on all of them in the final battle scene. They didn't beat him. They no. That's Tony true. just managed to outsmart him at the very end. That's true. Um, I mean he he still kicked everybody's ass. Everybody's. Um, I think you'd just seen it before. So, um, look, I think the expectations are different too. Like Infinity War, you knew there was a movie coming after it and they spent that whole movie. Basically it was Thanos's movie. So you kind of expected Thanos to win, right? Which is not what you want necessarily, but it is what we wanted. Um, and you going into this movie, look, the stakes aren't going to feel the same because you go into it pretty much assuming, well, at the end, the the, the Avengers are going to win. <laughs> it's, it's it's the last movie of the of the of the saga. So, um, overall, they won. They lost a few along the way, but um, but they gained back all those people that they lost from the last movie. So, hooray! Hmm. Uh, but kind of expected. So, yeah. you know, I, I I don't know that there is anything you could actually do in the storytelling that makes those stakes feel higher because we have an expectation <clears throat> that they're going to win. Yeah. I would be really curious to just really sheer curiosity. Um, if they were still working with Joss Whedon, I, I'm just curious how he would have written it, wh- what direction he would have gone in. Mm, well, I know he he tweeted about it. Yeah. Um, and it was me, nice me, tweet or mean tweet. <laughs> let me pull it up for you. Um, one second. So Joss I, I really enjoyed his storytelling in the first two. Um, see, a lot of people didn't like his storytelling in the second one, so. Yeah, uh, John John had some issues with some of the, well, how John's issue is the fact that throughout the entire thing, Vision goes on and on about how precious life is and then has no qualms about stomping Ultron to death. Like, yeah. And I mean, you're done. I'm a huge fan of Joss Whedon, but that movie had a lot of storytelling problems. Yeah. Um, okay, here's here's what he wrote in response to Endgame. It's very, very simple. Endgame, period. Guys, period. Jesus, period. Hashtag, no, you cried. (laughs) So I I think he's a fan. I think he liked it. (laughs) There you go. Um, You know, but one of the things he talked about was how increasingly difficult it was getting uh, telling the Avengers stories because so much had to come into it um you know and and you look at that final battle scene with all those characters visually um, that was really cool visually it was incredible i thought they gave everybody a chance to shine um and i mean how do you manage that (laughs) yeah (laughs) i mean it's uh, from a screenwriting standpoint, from a directing standpoint, you know, how, how do you manage that many characters on screen all at the same time and and feel like you give everybody something satisfying to do? Um, kind of incredible. And then and then just to bring back all those cameos, mm-hmm. you know, Robert Redford and Michael Douglas and <laughs> you know, it's who they even brought the kid back from Iron Man three. <laughs> Um, everybody's like, who the fuck's the kid at the funeral? (laughs) (laughs) Um, but that's who it was. It was the kid from Iron Man three. Yeah. Um, no, just, uh, I thought it was incredible. It was incredible what they were able to do. I'm looking forward to watching it again and seeing, seeing how my, uh, seeing what you my feelings about it hold up, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, $1.6 billion. Do you think it's going to knock avatar off the seat finally? Oh, Maybe that'd be cool. I am because Avatar Avatar sits at like two point eight billion. Can I tell you? I've never actually watched Avatar. Like I've tried on three different occasions, and I fell asleep every single time. Avatar was best watched when it came out in three D on the biggest screen you could find. Yeah, and any viewing of it after that is 
<laughs> it's not not the same. Well, you don't go watch a James Cameron film for the story. <laughs> Oh, Lord. And at the time, I mean, nothing looked like Avatar. I mean, it was it was visually stunning. And um, from a 3D perspective, it's still like one of the best 3D experiences you will ever have. Um, but, you know, as a film, I mean, they're trying to get something called unobtainium. <laughs> um, you know, it's... Dances um, with Smurfs. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, Fern Gully in space, you know. Yeah, Fern Gully was excellent. Yeah, so why would we have to do it again? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's me channeling Steve Schwartz. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, but, I don't uh, know if I can agree with you or not agree with you because I've never been able to make it through the movie. So um, someday, maybe if they do exactly. it again on big screens. Although probably not in 3D. 3D kind of makes me nauseous. He's working on his like four sequels to that movie. What? 3D, 3D, if it's done right, um, in in most cases won't make you feel nauseous. It's it's 3D that's done poorly that really makes you feel nauseous. Um, but you know, e- even that said, there's about. Uh, 18% of the population whose eyes are set either too far apart or too close together, um, that the 3d doesn't quite gel right. So, Hmm. um, and they have a hard time with it no matter what. That's why 3d will never, ever, you know, even in the, in the midst of the craziest bit of that fad, I, I told a lot of people, I'm like, 3d will never usurp the traditional movie going experience because there will always be people who just don't want to watch it that way because it sucks for them you know yep so. yeah but john's always pleased because he's like your cheap date we don't have to do the 3d which is like you know <laughs> 10 bucks more i will say this i want to go see Endgame um in 40x i want to i want to go do that so uh was it jordan who was uh somebody somebody that we know within the film community was like tweeting about that and how it was an amazing experience and i'm like okay that actually kind of sounds cool yeah, I've watched uh we watched the original Deadpool um in 40X and uh I watched oh gosh, what was the last one that I watched? I think it was Thor Ragnarok that way. Oh, that would be um fun. and it's a fun experience. It's an incredibly fun experience. It's not something I recommend doing all the time. <laughs> Because it's also kind of exhausting. Um and certainly for something like a three hour movie like Endgame, like go see it traditionally first see if it's a movie you even enjoy then then watch it with somebody's idea of enhancements um so you know what i think would be a fun one for that um i mean it would be silly but i think it'd be fun the uh the jumanji one that uh the rock was in the welcome to the jungle i could imagine that being fun with like having things missed you in the face and (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. All that sort so, of stuff. So, if you've watched any of the kind of experience movies at the theme parks at Disneyland or Universal Studios, it's essentially that experience where the seats rumble and move around, and they blow air at you, and they splash water at you, and they'll they'll inject scents and stuff into the air so you smell the trees, that sort of thing. Um, so, it's a lot of fun. It's it's an interesting way to watch a movie, uh, but it can also be terribly exhausting especially if you don't agree with the particular seat movements mm. um in a given sequence so you know in the end it is somebody's interpretation of what's happening visually on screen yeah so um it, you know <laughs> i think it's worth doing once in a while but i wouldn't do it for every movie by any means understandable Now, okay, so we've talked a lot about big screen experiences. Let's talk about our small screen experiences. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Uh, We had the Battle of Winterfell this past weekend. I mean, it was a hell of a weekend for big (laughs) franchise battle movies, right? (laughs) Um, The best meme I posted it was, uh, you know, be careful Starks. And it had both Tony Stark and the, you know, Starks of Winterfell. (laughs) Oh, I didn't even put that together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought uh, it was hysterical. Be careful this weekend, Starks, and had him like, ah. Uh, it was a great. weekend that was just Stark raving mad. Yes, true. All right, so, 
again, I feel like we need to note spoilers. If you haven't seen Game of Thrones, uh, Battle of Winterfell, more spoilers are going to happen like right now. <laughs> yeah. So bugger off and come back after you've watched uh, episode three of season eight of Game of Thrones. I I loved it. I, I um, love this one, too. <laughs> um, I'm right on board with you on this. Uh, I know. I know some people couldn't see it. <laughs> well, you can adjust. And I've been TVs. enjoying. I've been enjoying the hell out of all the memes of people like posting like black screens and stuff. <laughs> I mean, okay, so there were definitely some shots that were hard to see, but I also feel like that kind of added to the value of what you're watching because I know there were a couple moments where I leaned in to try and see better, and then something like jumped out at your freaking face, which yeah. is pretty much how those characters felt. It was like peering into the darkness, trying to see what's about to come and eat you. And then having your face ripped off. So yeah, and I think I think some people look. Some people don't have very good TVs, yeah. um, especially if your TV is a few years old and your backlight is dimming. Um, you know, I, I mean, that's why I replace my TVs every couple of years. Um, at least every four years, I'll replace my TV because the backlights dim dim down and dark dark scene images like that become very hard to see. Um, plus lower quality TVs, cheaper TVs, they have a harder time with the gradients. So you get a lot of chunking, um, in the gradients instead of a smooth color grade. Um, but that said, I agree with you. The filmmakers were obviously trying to like put the audience in the same boat as the characters where quite frankly, most of them are fighting and they can't see more than three or four feet around them. And all they hear is chaos, Mm -hmm. um, which I think it's. I mean, look, it's Game of Thrones, right? They, for as fantastical as that world is, they they do try to root it in some grounds of realism, um, in the way they shoot it and the way they uh, they approach the battles and stuff. So, um, it was fascinating. Well, I, you know, I know Peggy said she got to see it on IMAX, and uh, she's like, the quality was beautiful, you know, and you know, giant screens and everything. I'm like, oh, great. So no complaints well, from the, the, the larger bigger the format. screen. The bigger the screen, the brighter the projection, the easier it's going to be to see, right? I mean, that's yeah. just the way it is. Um, I, I I will admit when I first started to watch it, I was watching it on my like 27-inch, um, the oldest TV in my house. I was watching it on that at first, and I got about three minutes into the episode, and I was like, yeah, fuck this. And I went out to the living room, put it on the 4k in the living room and had no problems watching the rest of the episode. Yeah. So a lot of it really is the TV. Um, I know people were, were bitching at the cinematographer and the poor cinematographer like jumped out and like defended himself. But the reality is, is uh, I think it was, maybe it was screen rant. One of the, one of the websites actually went through and recolor graded a, a bunch of shots and a bunch of scenes. And there's a lot of detail in the image. Um, but I think the reality is, is the editors and, uh, the producers and the director, I think they, they really crushed the blacks in post, um, Mm -hmm. to try further enhance that kind of experience of not knowing what the hell's going on. So it's an artistic choice, like it or don't like it, whatever. Um, but, uh, I think it's unfair to blame the cinematographer. That's all. Yeah, I agree. Um, I but, did really uh, appreciate that that opening shot, though, like how long it was until the first cut. That was right? I, it was really quiet. I, yeah, I appreciate shots like that that take some rehearsal because, uh, mm. yeah, I was watching it and really enjoying it. And John looks over at me. He's like, they haven't cut yet, have they? I'm like, no, they haven't. And there it is. First cut. I'm like, ah, that was nice. Well, I like how they started on Sam, mm-hmm. who who is, you know, the R2 and 3PO of the game of thrones franchise um you know so it was fun to start on probably one of the meeker characters and then kind of work your way up to the to the tough ones you know yeah um and kind of get the full experience of what everybody is going through um i thought it was really well done um and then i think probably one of my favorite shots in the entire episode was melisande uh lighting all of the dothraki yeah the uh, swords yeah yeah and then watching them go out one by one when they charge yep so uh, because for so long a dothraki charge has been like the most terrifying thing to encounter uh militarily in this show 
Like you can't stop a Dothraki horde that's charging you. Uh, but their lights were extinguished. Um, and, and the Dothraki, I, I, I think I saw a couple in the dark running back in retreat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but they're basically extinct now. <laughs> yeah. There are very few left. I mean, well, that's what, what made Daenerys decide like she had to go and take her like, cause their plan was to like sit tight. And so yeah. she had to leave and she's like, Nope, gotta, gotta help out my people. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, hypothesis that's been thrown around is, you know, how much of a, a rift that's going to cause between her and John, because now he has prior claim to the throne or the better claim to the throne. And almost everyone she had to rule over is dead. Like a bunch of the unsullied got wiped out. Not all of them, but a good chunk. Yeah. Um, I mean, for her to go take the, <clears throat> take the throne now, she's got to rely on the North. Mm-hmm. Of what's left of it. Mm-hmm. Against the Golden Company, right? <laughs> yeah. Although so. I'm, I'm curious to see, because we haven't seen him in a while, but uh, Dario, um, she left him in charge of Marine. He uh, He's from the uh, opposing uh, hired hands, the um, Second Sons, which is another, like, they are another swords for hire, like the Golden Company are. So, oh, you think that they may pull the rabbit out of the hat? He may come to her aid? Maybe. I don't know. I I was just, I literally was just thinking about this this morning. I'm like, whatever happened to that dude? Haven't seen him in a while. He played a pretty major role in the books, less so in the, in the show, but like, and so I asked Lauren, I'm like, what happened to him? She's like, she, he's hanging out in Marine. I'm like, ah, oh, okay. Although he, he was also super butthurt that she wanted him to stay behind. Yeah, um, he was, so, but now he know, gets bitter, to live like bitterness a does cr- Yeah, but bitterness, bitterness does crazy things to guys on this show. So That's true. Uh, it could also be just as possible he shows up and fights against her. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that, that was the other thing. I was trying to remember. I'm like, wait, was he in the Golden Company or Second Sons? Ooh, I don't remember. Or did they mush those <laughs> two together in the show? It's also tough because like, I've read the books too, and a lot of times I conflate. I'm like, wait, did that happen? Which one did that happen in? Who did that in this one? Right. So, and well, I am blissfully free of having read any of the books. So. Yeah. <laughs> I can just well, enjoy the show for what it is. I just, I just hope that I someday get to read the conclusion of the books because George. Nobody's going to get to read the conclusion. He's going to eat himself to death before he finishes <laughs> those books. Way to be optimistic, there, David. Uh, but yeah, he says that he's going to do it differently than the show. Um. But he also said many years ago that the showrunners already knew kind of the the big points to his endings. So. Yeah, well, that's I mean, when they when they moved past him in the books, um, you know, the discussion has been that he he gave them the outline of where the sh- where the story is supposed to end. But is so he going to change be, it now? Be, that- there will be differences. He did say he kept a couple things for himself is what I remember him saying in an okay. interview. Yeah. So um, there might be a couple things that get changed. But I, I honestly don't think he's going to ever finish him. He doesn't know how to sit down and stay focused enough to get him done. Right. But yet we, but yet we have a prequel series already. We have Dunk Eggs here. Like it's like, come on, come on, attention, yeah, back stop, over here. Stop farting around with all this other crap and get your get your main storyline done. Right. <laughs> it's like it's great, but how about the one that like is supposed to be your your magnum opus of writing? How about you finish that? Uh, I, uh, it was, I was having this discussion with Lauren this morning while she was visiting and she actually read the very first book, like within a couple years of it coming out. So, so like back in the early nineties. Yeah. <laughs> and she, and so she's one of those people who can really complain about this. She's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You have no idea. Cause I said something about, yeah, the, the last book is what, like a year late now it's supposed to be delivered October of 2018. And she goes, more like 20 years late. <laughs> she's a little, little perturbed. Um, yeah. And how long, cause she's, she's read them multiple times over because, you know, by the time the next one comes out, it's like, wait, what was happening? I don't even remember anymore. Exactly. But, um, <laughs> um, I, I, I really enjoyed the character beats. Um, this is the one thing that game of Thrones typically does pretty well. Um, even in the midst of big battles is they figure out how to tell the character beats um, throughout the, the episode. Um, I enjoyed watching 
um, Serbrian. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That was like fighting, the best. fighting like a mad woman. And, um, Jamie actually having a moment to save her, um, yeah. which I thought was fantastic. Um, I hope that his redemption story comes to a, a happy ending. Oh, I feel like um, it's not going to, I think, uh, I, I feel like Jamie's going to die and, uh, well, dying is fine. I, I, I just hope that he stays on that redemptive arc. I hope he doesn't make a fuck up and, and unredeem himself for Cersei. I think he's going to be the one who ends up killing Cersei. Well, he is the Kingslayer, so yeah. might as well round it out and become the Queen Slayer too, you know? Well, um, he like, you know, cause the prophecy is your little brother. And for the longest time, she's always assumed it was Tyrion, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and technically Jamie is, is she, she came out before Jamie. So, uh, yeah. he's little brother by minutes, but still. Yeah. They did make a point of, of mentioning that in the show like two seasons ago. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is, uh, is they've established now that, interpretation of prophecy can be you know an iffy uh thing right mm -hmm. melisan kept making mistakes in her interpretations mm -hmm. for the last four years and then uh this final revelation that it was the princess who was promised not the prince um you know i mean it's cool it's cool the way expectations are subverted a little bit you know well and also um, like okay so now Arya is essentially azora's eye what does that mean exactly azora high yeah yeah well um yeah i mean they saved the day from the long night right that's that was the, what the prophecy was about so. yeah um that prophecy's done as far as i'm concerned um but yeah, yeah, interesting that it looks like Cersei's really going to be the the true big bad for Westeros, uh, not so much the the Long Night and the Night's King, which is a really interesting turn because I I was not expecting it to go that way at all. Honestly, what I thought was going to happen was that the Battle of Winterfell was going to be a fake out. They were going to have about half the undead army to deal with. And that the Night's King was going to take his dragon and go sack King's Landing and get himself a few million more undead to like and come But that's around making an south. assumption that the Night's King knows anything about what's going on south <clears throat> of the wall. Mm, I mean, I guess I guess my assumption was made in the fact that he kind of has that weird connection to Bran, and Bran, you know, is a green seer. So, yeah, he's like the World Wide Web. <laughs> <laughs> um no but you know if you really think about cersei and how they've been building up her character i mean from the earliest point she's she's been in control of the was it the the wildfire mm -hmm. uh, underneath all of king's landing yeah <laughs> right like she's the one who's been putting all that there and building that up and um I mean, I very much see her being a it's my throne or nobody's throne kind of kind of deal at this point. Um, one one thing I saw a theory, which I think is fascinating, is um, people who committed horrible atrocities earlier in the show have been meeting the same atrocity fate for themselves later. Yeah. Um, and someone brought up um, that, you know, Cersei's now pregnant, right? Um, supposedly. Cersei's now pregnant. And wouldn't it be interesting if she meets a similar fate to Rob Stark's wife, who was pregnant when she was killed? Yeah. Um, since, the, since the Lannisters ordered that, she's part of the Lannister family. Um, it would be interesting to see her die a similar fate. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I, I like reading theories, but I also like just trying to enjoy the show for what it ends up being. Cause theories are great. Oftentimes better than what we end up with. <laughs> um, but now I, I, I also loved that Arya, uh, yeah. got the big moment. Yeah, that was great. 
uh, I think there is some there is some tweet or some interview with Kit Harrington where they ask him like, you know, how'd you feel not being the hero? And he's like, I was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. But yeah, Maisie Williams, I've been following her Instagram like the day after she posted some hysterical thing. And she's like, day after that episode, how do I feel? And it was like her and Sansa dance or um, Sophia Turner dancing around to uh, Soldier Boy. (laughs) (laughs) It was so stupid, but hysterical. Yeah, I mean, she got to be super bad. The thing is, and... I don't know why. Like, I'm usually pretty good at, like, picking up on the the little hints that get laid down. I did not see that coming. I think because I'd forgotten about it amongst all the other melee of the battle. Because, you know, Melisandre had, like, said you're going to close brown eyes and green eyes and blue. Strong emphasis on the blue. And then uh, Arya just, like, takes off like a shot. And I had that moment where I'm like, okay, she's off to battle the White Walkers. And it didn't occur to me that, like, No, she's off to kill the Night's King specifically. So it was like a great moment of shock when she just like jumped out of the dark like a cat. Like awesome. I had forgotten about her for a little bit. And then the second John got pinned down, um, it dawned on me that we hadn't seen Arya in a while. Hmm. (laughs) And I was like, where's Arya? (laughs) Um. So it was really satisfying to see her coming out of the dark. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, and but it, you totally and, and, had that moment where you thought he was going to ice her, like just snap her little neck. Yeah. But, you know, again, they, they, they've been dropping the hints on how she was going to do it for a while. Because um, when she was battling uh, Brienne, you know, Brienne got her pinned up and she flipped the knife to the other hand and got in there. You know, I mean. Yeah. Everything has been shown to us prior yeah. to that moment that she had the tool set to handle herself, you know, and um, ah, it was such a great payoff because I just binged the whole series the last two months. So thank God I did that for myself because like all of this training she's gone through super fresh in my mind and really her whole storyline from season one to now has been prepping her to be the person in that moment. Um which was just fascinating. So much, so much reward. Um, again, yeah. fan service, you know, really great fan service it pay, pays off to watch and pay attention. Yeah, that was great. And I loved like, there was so many, um, I mean, I'm sure you've seen them on, on YouTube and stuff where there were a fan gatherings, different places where they watched it on the big screen and stuff. I, um, and the people crowd, were freaking nuts. Yeah. Cause everybody <laughs> literally got, he got, to, <gasps> and then, <gasps> <laughs> like oh and i don't usually say much whenever i'm watching the show but we got to that point and i just went are you for the win yes and john looks <laughs> over at me like okay that's the most enthusiastic you've gotten about anything in a while i'm like yeah that was awesome well and i love too that it, in the end it comes all the way back to john giving her needle mm-hmm. and saying you just stick them with the pointy end yep <laughs> and that's all she did to the night king <laughs> She just yeah. stuck him with the pointy end and that was it. Yeah. Uh, freaking brilliant. Uh, yeah. You know, l- lovely, lovely bit of poetic storytelling. It was, it was fantastic. Other um, little details throughout that. Do you think that Sansa and Tyrion are going to end up together in the end? I hope so. I hope so too. I think Tyrion deserves it. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's, it's like she told him, like, he's been the best of any uh, man that she's ever had as far as like the quote unquote, you know, husbands that she's had. Um, well, and, and I mean, just in general, he's always shown her respect Yeah. In, in a, in a world where none of the men in her life show her respect uh, until she's fought for it. Tyrion just gave it to her always. Yeah. Um, and I love his character. I love his storyline. And oh, did you watch the interviews the, on, on HBO? They had the interviews with the different actors um, before they did the premiere. Uh, it, I loved his. Like, if you get a chance to go on HBO, um, uh, I can't remember if it's HBO Go or, or whatever. One of those autoplay ones, they have the interviews. And his, I, I got a little choked. I came out to John and I'm like, oh my gosh, he's so well-spoken. Because he's just talking about, like, the craft of acting and, like, how playing this character has made him a better person. 
And I was like, so impressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's Dinklage has done a great job with that character. Um, yeah. Uh, now we get to see, uh, Danny and John and see where that goes. Um, yeah. You know, John, John's never wanted the throne though. Like it's never been his driving force. Um, and, and leadership's not something he looks for, you know, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, it just gets thrust upon him all the time. So, um, now that his big white whale has been shattered, um, they'll be curious to see what John's motivations are going forward. Well, I mean, I think despite the knowledge of the fact that she's his aunt, he's still in love with Danny. So uh, I think if she desperately well, wanted the throne, why wouldn't he be? Right. Uh, <laughs> plus, she gave him a dragon, man. Like, that's. I love that bit. You've totally ruined horses for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. I, I want to say that, yeah, they could really easily use this as a device to like create strife among them, because like I said, most of her army has been wiped out and she's she's lost a lot of things that were important to her, Jora, And uh, if she loses one of the dragons or both of the dragons in the battle with Cersei, then she could really like go off the deep end. But also, is she that petty? And, and is John that like easily like, is he going to be that su- easily seduced by by power, you know, that he would. Uh, fight with her. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, there is the classic. Um, it's not really John's decision anymore. He is the rightful heir to the throne, right? So, it uh, being a royal isn't something you choose. It's something you're born into, and it's thrust upon you the expectation. So it is going to be very curious to see how that plays out. Cause right now only what four people know. Yeah. So, um, be curious to see if he keeps it to himself or if the word starts to spread. Hmm. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to be interesting to see. Oh, and Jora. Um, I thought that was a very nice ending for, for Jora. That was. That, well. was a, that was a very good ending. And hey, they gave a nice little ending to uh, Lady Mormont, the little girl. Yeah, Liana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. David and Goliath moment, you know? Yeah. What was um, so great about her character is she was just supposed to be a, a one a one episode. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, she's but she awesome. She came on screen and everybody went, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta give this girl more. Um, all the way up to a fantastic uh, final scene in, in Battle of Winterfell. Yeah. So, no, it's a, it's a good show. Um, they're doing a good job. There's only three episodes left, and supposedly they're all hour and a half plus long episodes. So, a uh, lot of story left to tell. It's great. And then when they're gone, I guess we'll have to fill our lives with Westworld, which is... <laughs> I honestly, I really like Westworld. It's such a mind bender. Uh, Do we know when season three is supposed to drop? I think sometime this summer, maybe. Don't quote me on that. Uh, They might have been holding it out a little longer since we have, you know, Game of Thrones to console us. Right. So. Okay. We'll Well, see. More of the viewing. (laughs) Couple of days till the next... uh, game of thrones so um yeah if uh if you guys haven't been checking it out we relaunched the sci-fi sunday podcast that's sunday as in like the ice cream so s-u-d s-u-n-d-a-e um you can find it on itunes and google music and uh at the intellectual.com uh it's myself and jordan jacobo and Teresa and brian and, uh, you know, a bunch of our friends and Whitney will be joining us on occasion as well. Uh, just shooting the shit about sci-fi and comics and pop culture, much the way this episode of yeah. the intellectual has been. <laughs> um, but we're going to be doing it weekly at sci-fi Sunday. So make sure you're subscribed to that and, uh, tuning in and listening to what we have to say. Cause you know, 
we we are, we are interesting people. And Important question, listening. David. <laughs> yes. Can, can we eat Sundays while doing the Sci-Fi Sunday? You know, I've been suggesting that since we first did the show six years ago. Um, it has yet to actually happen, I think. But uh, yeah, let's make it happen. Yeah. I, yes, I think that should definitely happen. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, check out Sci-Fi Sunday. And of course, this is the Intellectual Podcast. And I've been sitting with my dear friend and co-host. Whitney Wegman Wood. <laughs> trip dubs and mm-hmm. i'm your host as i've been for six years on the intellectual david s dawson thank you so much for joining us we will catch you on the next episode all right bye guys hello there citizens i am the terror that flaps in the night i am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime i am dark wing duck telling you please Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. Intellectual.